are continuing our um, series that we began three weeks ago. I'm a believer. It's based on the fact that we believe, right, as followers of Jesus, everything about us has to do with our faith in him, our belief in him, our trust in him. Uh, and so we, our theme this year is believe, and we have spent several months of, the, of this first part of the year to remind us who we believe in, who our God is, and what he's done for us. And not just know it here, but then begin to believe it here to understand who he is. And one of the things that we've constantly reminded ourselves of is the more you know God, the more you'll know yourself as a follower of Jesus. Our identity, our true identity is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, God created us, right? He designed us. And so if anybody's going to tell us what our identity is, it's not going to be found anywhere else. It's going to be found in him and what he declares about us. And so as a follower of Christ, we recognize who we are. And one of the things that we constantly remind ourselves of is the fact that when we believe what we believe, what we know, will always affect how we behave, what we do. And so here's the key idea behind this message series. We'll be saying it over and over again. When I know who I am, I'll know what to do. Can you say that with me? When I know who I am, I'll know what to do. Can you tell tell somebody next to you that without looking at the screen? Good. Very good. I hope you said that because it didn't sound like anything to me. Just it sounded like a bunch of... So here's the thing. The point of of the series is very simple. God tells you who you are. And then you have a choice. You need to either know that, right? You're going to know it because I'm going to tell you. But are you going to believe it? So the choice is, yes, that's who I am. Or you know what? I don't believe that's who I am. And if you don't believe that's who you are, you will continue in identity confusion for the rest of your life but when you believe who you are in christ jesus you will have the sureness of who you are your identity and and the bottom line is this that we will never live out the fullness of the abundant life that christ died to give us until we start to walk in the identity he has told us who we are and so we know what to do okay so the last two weeks we've examined the fact the truth that as believers in christ we are his ambassadors And as his ambassadors, we are constantly representing him. That means that we represent him on this earth. We represent heaven on earth. We represent his kingdom on this earth. We live in in the kingdom of this world, but we are not part of that kingdom of this world. We are part of another kingdom, and that's God's kingdom. And then we also saw that we are his masterpiece. We are his workmanship. We are his handiwork. And so he has, whatever he does, is always good and he has looked at you has recreated you in christ jesus if you're a new creation you are his masterpiece for a purpose amen so today what i want to look at is i want to look at two metaphors two pictures that jesus uses to illustrate for us and describe for us who we are as his followers who we are when we believe in him and they're found in matthew chapter 5 if you want to turn there if you have your bibles you can turn to matthew 5 If you have your devices, turn them on to Matthew chapter 5. And so here's what I, one of the things that you right away find out about Jesus is that he came preaching about the kingdom of God. His main subject was the kingdom of God, especially in the gospel of Matthew. In the gospel of Matthew, Matthew, the writer of that gospel, presents Jesus as the king of God's kingdom. He presents him as the king with with a rightful uh, with a rightful throne to be king, okay, the right, the right to, be, to be king. The first words of the first sermon that Jesus preached was repent for the kingdom of God is near. So in his preaching and his teaching, Jesus reveals to us who the people of the kingdom of God are. He reveals that he's the king. He reveals that he come, he's come to establish his kingdom, his rule, his reign. But then he tells us who the people of the kingdom are. And as the people of the kingdom, he reveals to us what we are supposed to be, how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to live. He describes for us as kingdom people the essential attitudes, character, and life that every born-again believer should be reflecting and living if you are part of the kingdom of God. So essentially, Jesus tells his people, if you're going to be part of my kingdom, then you need to know who you are as my kingdom people, and you need to know what you are supposed to be doing as my kingdom people. 
If that makes sense to you, kind of just give me a little nod and say yes. Okay, okay, good. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand his word today and apply it. So Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are right there in the midst of them. Thank you, Jesus, for being here today. I thank you for your spirit, O oh God, that lives not only within us, he works among us, but he lives within us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would lead us and guide us into the truth today that we need to know, that we need to apply in our lives. God, I pray that your word would be like a mirror that, that kind of shows us who we are and where we are today. And I pray that as a result, we would be changed. I pray that 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 change would happen for your glory and for our good so that Jesus' name would continue to be made even more famous than it is today. And I pray it all in his name, in Jesus' name, and all of God's kingdom people said, Amen. Amen. So the Lord uses two metaphors here. He uses two illustrations, two pictures to tell us and to illustrate for us and describe what the believer becomes when that person is saved. So we saw two weeks ago that when we come to Jesus, he actually does a transformational work, a supernatural work in us. He doesn't reform us from the outside in. He transforms us from the inside out. He actually gives us a new desire and new affections. He gives us a new spirit, a new nature that is fashioned after his own nature. And therefore, we become new creations in Christ Jesus. We become a specific and a very different, unique kind of creation in all of creation. And so when we come to Jesus, he says, listen, when you're changed and transformed, you become something different. And he tells us part of what we become here with these two pictures. He explains it to us, and it has a purpose behind it, right? So he says that when you are part of him, when you are in Christ Jesus, you become salt and light. Now notice in both cases when we were reading the scriptures, he said you are. He said, you are the salt of the earth. He said, you are the light of the world. He didn't say you will become. He didn't say you should act like it. He says, you are. Your very being is of salt and light. Now, when we look at the nature of the two objects that he actually uses as a picture to describe for us who we become, and you look at the nature of salt and light, I believe that we can safely say today and make this declaration as part of who we are, our identity, and that's this. I am God's kingdom influencer. Can you say that with me? I am God's kingdom influencer. His influencer. Influencer for his kingdom as his kingdom people. I know that most of us here know that in the last decade or so, the the rise of social media influencers has transformed our world. It has transformed the marketing industry for sure. So social media has taken everyday people, everyday folks who without any name recognition whatsoever or really any accomplishments and have trans has transformed them into celebrities with in some cases millions and millions of people that they are influencing on a daily basis. So the corporations find this out and, and the marketing uh, 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 arms of these, of these products find out and the more followers you have, the more they're going to pay you to influence people to purchase their product, to go towards their product. So it ends up that a whole lot of people make a whole lot of money. These are social media in influencers. Well, Jesus calls us salt and light. And friends, these are the two of the most essential elements of life. Of life. And, and here's the thing. Salt and light, by their very nature, are influential elements. 
They are both transformative by nature. Salt and light impact and influence their environment. When the light is, is present, you know it. When salt is present or absent, you know it. And God declares every believer in Jesus Christ as an influencer in God's kingdom. But our goal is not to become rich or famous as God's influencers. Our impact doesn't have temporary ramifications. It has eternal ramifications. Our influence is not for us to gain some temporary popularity or some temporary power or some temporary possession. Our influence is to bring about an eternal impact not just in our lives, but in the lives of those around us that we actually influence. We may not be social media influencers, but we are all, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are, we are all kingdom influencers. Because Can you say that with me? I am God's kingdom influencer. Turn to somebody and tell them that. I am God's kingdom influencers. We, the church, and when I say the church, it's people, Right, The church are to have kingdom influence in our world. By our very nature, according to Jesus, we are to have transformative, a transformative impact on our communities. We ought to have a transformative impact on our work, in our workplace. We ought to have a transformative impact on our families. That no matter where we are, we are actually part of the influence of God to transform our environment for the glory of God and for the good of those that are being transformed. And Jesus clarifies our, our goal as influencers. He gives us two pictures. He gives us one goal and he gives us two warnings that we're going to look at today. But our goal as influencers, let's look at that real quick. Our goal is not to make money. It's not to become popular. It's not to, to get the applause of men. What is our goal? He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And the reason he has made us that and calls us that is that the people that we have contact with, that they may see. So it's something they see. It's something that's perceivable to the people around you. And they're good deeds, right? And as a result, they will what? Glorify your Father in heaven. If I were to ask you this question, if I were to ask you, why did God save you? For those of you that are followers of Jesus why did God save you? How would you answer, right? Because I think, I think many of us would answer in, in different ways, but we would probably say, you know what? He saved me so that I wouldn't go to hell, and, I, and instead I'd go to heaven. Or he saved me so that I can have a, a relationship with my heavenly Father. And some of you would say, well, he saved me to transform me, to change me so that I could become, become more and more like Jesus, and if you answered any of those questions or all of them, it, they would all be true. But I would submit to you they would be incomplete. They would be incomplete answers. And I say that because if those were the only reasons God saved you, then why are you still on this earth? Because all of those answers would still be true in heaven. But you're not in heaven yet. You're still on this earth. So why then did Jesus save you and leave you on this earth? And Jesus gives us a basic answer to that question. Jesus saved me to make a difference on earth for his glory. Jesus didn't just save you so you can get to heaven. He didn't just save you so that you can become like Jesus. He didn't get, just save you so you can have peace and joy and, and, and live this great life. He saved you so that you, you, turn to somebody and say you, you, can make a difference on earth. And it has to be for his, his glory, right? So when you think about these two metaphors that Jesus kills us, he says, listen, this is, describes who you are as my kingdom people. What he is saying to us is that you are, you are God's change agents. You, you are influencers in this world. You, you are difference makers, for Christ, the Lord saved you and kept you on this earth to be a kingdom influencer. 
with a goal. Again, what's the goal of our influence? Well, let's read it again. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your what? Your good deeds, your good works, the way you live, the way you are. And as a result, they will glorify your father in heaven. He's got to be your father, right? That means that he's, you're already part of the family. But it says that they will be influenced and they will in turn glorify your father in heaven like, like you do. So our goal as influencers is to influence people to change. And as a result of that change, they will end up glorifying our father in heaven. Does that make sense? Say amen. So, so here's what I want you to see. To glorify. What does that mean? Because, you know, we use that word, well, I glorify him and we're here for his glory. But what does it mean to glorify God? That word glorify means this. It means to make God's works, to make God's person, his character, visible. To make his works, his, vis his character, manifest. To manifest him. Here's the thing. God is invisible. Amen? His character is his character is invisible. His love, his joy, his peace, his, his patience, his, his faithfulness, all of that is invisible. So how does God make himself visible to the people that need to know him? By our lives representing him, by our lives manifesting who he is, by our lives making visible by our good deeds and by our character who Jesus is. So He's saying is, when you begin to declare my works, which are in the past, nobody can see them, but I say, you know what? I remember when God did this, and I praise him for that, and I glorify him for what he has done and what he is doing. And when people begin to see that, well, what's going to happen? The hope is that they also would see and want what we have. They would go after this God that we are visibly manifesting and and making real and they will in turn be changed they will become salt and light glorify god but they in turn would continue the process of becoming influencers as well does that make sense so 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 this is what explains 2000 years ago it was a group of 120 people on the upper room and from 120 people, we have billions and billions of those that have put their faith in Jesus Christ. Out of 120 people, Christianity, the faith in Christ, has transformed all of civilization. Why? Because one led another to another to another, and every one of them recognized, I have my part in this. All of us are influencers for Jesus. So as a result of our influence... That person can become a, a believer in Christ. That person is transformed. That person becomes salt and light. He begins to glorify God. She begins to glorify God. And the process repeats itself. So here's the thing. God has left us here as his kingdom servants on this earth to be his influencers to his glory. That people would actually see Jesus in you and me. That's our goal. That's our goal. It's not about us. Can I get an amen? It's not about me. It's not about, oh, people are going to follow me and people are going to like me. No, no, no. It's not anything to do with me. It has everything to do with less of me and more of Jesus. So they can then be influenced to the kingdom of God. So let's dig a little deeper into these two pictures that Jesus gives us to describe us. And I think we'll get a little better understanding of what he expects from us as salt and light. So let's look at the first one. That's salt. What does he say? That you are. Turn to somebody and tell them that. You are the salt of the earth. So, so there's earth and then there's you. There's earth and then there's salt. And he says you are the salt of this earth. It's not a question of whether or not as a believer in Jesus Christ you are salt or not. He says you are. You are. You need to believe that. You need to believe it so it will affect your behavior. So what was Jesus saying about you when he called you salt? What does he mean? There's several characteristics of salt that I can share with you. I want to just share with you three influential characteristics of salt that God wants to see reproduced in his people. Here's the first one. Salt preserves. Salt preserves. Salt has a preserving effect. It keeps things from going bad and decaying. 
it cleanses, it disinfects. When Jesus 2,000 years ago said, you are the salt, everybody understood the essentialness of salt. It was critical for every home, every household to have a portion of salt. Salt was essential to the ancient world, even more so than it is for us today. Servants were hired often in exchange for salt. You know, they say, well, I like that guy, I'll give you this much and then have them serve me. And some of them were good and some of them were worth their weight in salt. That's where we got that from. They're not worth their salt. That's where we got that from. Romans, Roman soldiers would receive a salt allowance as part of their pay for serving Rome. It was called the salarium, which is what we get the word salary from. Aren't you glad you get paid in money and not salt today? <laughs> so every household, every household understood the importance of salt and needed salt. Remember, this is pre-refrigerator days. And so salt was the only thing that would prevent meats and fish from rotting. And many of Jesus' followers, as he's preaching to them, and many in that, especially in Galilee, they were, what by, by trade, they were fishermen. And so they understood the, the necessity of packing their fish for long journeys to keep it fresh until they got to the market. So Jesus is reminding his people that as his kingdom people, listen, this world that we live in is deteriorating. And man, it seems like in the last few years, it is, on, it is on hyperdrive deterioration. It's getting from bad to worse. This world that we live in without Jesus is rotting in sin. And we have a part to play to stop that, to, to delay that, to prevent that to a certain extent. The Bible gives us ex descriptions of what that looks like. The natural man, the natural woman apart from Jesus... All that, is, that comes, and, and there's different levels of this, but this is what resides within every person without Jesus. In Galatians 5, it says, The acts of the flesh are the sinful nature that all of us were born with are obvious. People can see that. Sexual immorality. Impur impurity and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. So far, does it sound like the world we live in? Yeah. Hatred. Discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He writes to Timothy and he says, listen, in the last days people will be lovers of self and not lovers of God. They will have a form of godliness, but they don't have the power of true godliness. That people will be all kinds of evil and wickedness that... There will be disobedience from children to parents. All of this is part of the sinful nature apart from Jesus. That's the world that we live in, friends. And he says, I warned you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so he says, you're salt. And just as salt cleanses and preserves, so too is the believer to be an agent of change and preservation in the unbeliever's life. There are some that are married and, they, and that one gets saved, the other one does it. Well, the Bible tells the, the, the saved one, the Christian, stay. Maybe through your presence there and the Holy Spirit living in you, your spouse will be changed. There's a preserving element to who we are in Christ Jesus, right? And so here's the thing. How is it that salt can have this kind of influence? And the main reason salt can be so influential is because salt is unique. It is very unique chemical. You take one part of that chemical, it becomes, it becomes poison. But you mix them together, that compound becomes something useful, right? There is no other chemical compound like salt. No other compound impacts so many different areas like salt. That's the power of salt's influence. The power of salt's influence lies in how different it is. Its uniqueness is distinctiveness. If I blindfolded you and I gave you a little bit of oregano, some of you would get it, some of you wouldn't. Some of you are like, oregano, what is that? 
human, you wouldn't know. Some of you would, some of you wouldn't. But if I gave you just a pinch of salt, everybody in this room would know that's salt. That's salt because it's very unique. It is very unique. And so, and so here's the thing. What he is saying is that believers, just like salt, if we're going to be influential the way God wants us to be, then we too must be unique. We too must be distinct from the world that we're supposed to be influencing. Because the power of our influence is not that we become more like the world. The power of our influence is that we become less like the world. Less of the stuff that we just finished reading a little bit ago. So the power of our lives, the testimony, and the power of our testimony lies in our distinctiveness and our uniqueness. James writes to believers and he says to remain uncorrupted by this world. That implies that we can be corrupted by this world. We can be corrupted by what we hear and see and who we hang out with. In Romans 12, Paul says, don't become like the people of this world. We must be different. The church must be different. Turn to somebody and say, you and I need to be different. Because, you listen, our influence depends on us being unique and different from the world. If we talk like the world and we act like the world and we do the same stuff that the world does, friends, you have no influence. You're done. When people look at us as followers of Jesus Christ, they ought to see a difference. People should look at you and look at us and say, how is it that they go through the same painful things that I go through and yet they respond so differently? How is it that I can't conquer this habit and yet they have? How is it that their love is so deep and lasting as a husband and wife and ours is so shallow and inconsistent? How can she forgive and not hold on to that grudge and unforgiveness, but I can't seem to get over the slightest offense that I have given? That will look at us and say, these are the most compassionate, patient, kind people that I have ever met. I wonder why. What is it about them that's different? They should say, look at the businessman, the Christian businessman and say, I have never seen so much integrity and honesty as I see in this man. See, it's the uniqueness and distinctiveness of our lives that causes people to want what we have. Our, our difference from the world, our distinctiveness and the way we live and the way we respond to this world ought to cause people to become thirsty for God in the same way that salt makes us thirsty for water. How I many you know salt makes you thirsty? How I many of you have ever gone to a movie theater? You can raise your hand. It's not a sin anymore. Go ahead and raise it up. Here's the thing. When you go to a movie theater, you got to have popcorn. I know you guys bring your pickles too, but you got to have popcorn for sure, right? And so when you buy your popcorn, they make sure that that popcorn is not bland. It has a lot of salt in it. You know why? Because you can get the popcorn for a certain amount of money, but if once you have that, then you got to buy that, that drink for $800 to quench that, that thirst. They know how to make you thirsty, right? So here's the thing. That's, our lives ought to be that way. We ought to live in such a way that it causes people to say, I want what you have. You're so different and you have such joy and peace and all these things that I'm thirsty for that. Right? When the church is unique, and I'm talking about the, the, the church today, the, the church world, right? Church is people. And the Western church has lost its uniqueness in so many different ways. And there's a reason why people don't want anything to do with church and they want nothing to do because it, they look too much like the world and it's envy and it's hypocrisy and all the garbage. Not that people are going to be perfect, but even when we're imperfect, we respond to our imperfection in a different way that the world does. When the church is different and unique, it attracts people to Jesus. But when the church is the same as in the world, 
when it treats people the same the way the world does, when it, when it acts the same the way the world does, when it does stuff in Christian meetings that you can see in any part of the world, it loses its influence. And in a sense, it becomes useless because the salt has lost its flavor, which is another one of the influential characteristics of salt, that salt flavors. It flavors. It influences the taste of things. It takes a bland, tasteless food and makes it tasty. Right? There, there are some foods that just by looking at them make your mouth water. Like hospital food, for instance. Why are you laughing? Now, why do you laugh when I say hospital food? Because hospital food by its very nature is bland. It's bland. We want nothing to do with it. And Paul writes to to Titus, and he tells him, listen, this is how believers should be living, and this is how believers should act, and, and this is how believers should treat each other. And he gives them the end result of believers living like Jesus and being like Jesus. He says, so that in every way, they will make the teaching about God our Savior, what? Attractive. Attractive. I like the way the Living Bible puts it. In this way, they will make people want to believe in our Savior and God. That's the goal, right? It's our unique difference. It's the way that we live differently that causes people to want to change and glorify our Father in heaven. If I hang out with somebody that doesn't know Jesus and I talk like them and I, and I act like them and I, and I do the same stuff that they do, there is nothing there that they're going to want different because there's nothing different about me. Now, saying all that does not mean that every unbeliever is going to accept you or accept the message of Jesus. Because salt just isn't just tasty if it's used correctly. But how many know that sometimes people reject salt? Some people are not used to salt and too much salt causes them to turn it away. Too much salt gags you. I remember, I'll never forget, I was about four years old. I may remember something that happened to you so harsh that you remember it when you're four years old that's me my older brother was he's, he was constantly messing with me and he knows i love sweets so one day he came with his handful and he says you want some sugar and i said yes and he poured it into my mouth it was salt salt gags right sometimes we are too salty <laughs> and we can gag people in a way that god doesn't want us to Salt in a wound is irritating. So you'll be around somebody and you are so different from them that it actually messes with them. It reveals their life that doesn't line up with God's and you become an actual irritant to them. Right? So, so when you start living like Jesus, yes, there will be some that will be attracted to the God you serve, but there will be some that will reject you and the God you serve. Jesus, right before he tells us that we are salt, he says this, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Doesn't end there. He says, because of me. Not because you're, you're just irritating. Not because you're hitting people over the head with the Bible. They ought to reject you then. No, he says, because you're living like me, because you're acting like me, because you, you work like me, you're doing good, people will reject you because of me, he says. And says, be, be happy about that. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, right? For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you, and they persecuted him as well. So here's the deal. Regardless of rejection, you need to continue to be salt, to the world you can't let rejection stop you from being the person god made you can i get an amen, amen. so remember you are the salt of the earth come on turn to somebody and say you are the salt of the earth and the second picture jesus gives us is light light he says you are the light of the world now jesus is 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 
speaking about light here, and it's interesting. In order for us to understand when he says you are the light of the world, we also have to understand what he said about being the light of the world earlier and other places in Scripture. So, for instance, in John chapter 8, it says when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Aren't you thankful? But will have, will have the light of life. In John chapter 9, he says, as long as I am in the world. That's a prerequisite. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So now he looks you in the eyes and he says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. In other, in other words, he's not here anymore. He is at the right hand of the Father. So now he sent his spirit to live inside you so that now... Since he's not in the world anymore, there has to be a light in the world. Guess who, who the light is? You are. The church is. The people of God. The kingdom people of God that are still on this earth. You have taken his place while he is gone. Now listen, be, don't misunderstand me. Jesus is still the light of the world. He is the light of the world. But now what he does is he chooses to shine through you. So the light still comes from him. You're just the reflector of that light. 2 Corinthians 3.18 makes that very clear. It says, but we Christians have no veil over our faces. We can be what? Mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. He earlier says that the, the glory of God shines brightest and shines perfectly in the face of Christ. So without Jesus, we have no light. The glory of God reflects and flows from Jesus. You've seen him, you've seen the Father. He perfectly represents all that God is. But now that we are in Christ Jesus, it is his light shining from us. We reflect his light. So if I had a mirror here and I had a flashlight, if I shine the, shone the flashlight in your face, that's Jesus. But now I shine the flashlight off the mirror, that same light's going to reflect and it's going to hit. Now if I get a hundred mirrors up here and I shine the light, it's going to go a hundred different directions. That's the church. Right? That's what Jesus is doing through us and in us. And so uh, several characteristics of light that should be reflected through our life. Light is clear and pure. And so should our lives be. If there's any bad in us, we need to confess it and make ourselves clean again in the name of Jesus. Light penetrates. By nature, it cuts and eliminates darkness. In fact, it penetrates so much that today we have learned how to, how to make it so condensed that it becomes a laser that actually cuts. It's still light. Light guides. It directs the way to go and, and leads the right path. Light reveals. Light reveals the reality of an area. Right? So, so if, you, if you look in a mirror and it's lit up, it's lit up. Like, like there are some really fancy restaurants and they keep, they keep the restrooms really dim with little smoky mirrors. So you go in there, you're like, man, I'm looking good tonight. And then you get home and you look at it in the bright light, you're like, what in the world? Nobody told me about this. Because the more light, the more reveals the reality. That light in the restaurant wasn't giving you the reality. Light reveals the reality of an area. See, darkness covers, but light uncovers. Darkness hides reality. Light exposes reality. That's what John is talking about here in John 3. He says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. What revealed those deeds? The light. It brought, it, it, it brought the reality of their deeds. Whoever, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be what? Exposed. There are people that stop following Jesus and they stop getting together with the people of God. And so they will separate themselves. Even though the best place to be when you mess up is right back with the people of God so God can get a hold of you. But why do they stay away? Because every time they come, the light exposes their deeds and they, don't, they feel uncomfortable. They don't want to be exposed. They like the darkness and don't want to be in the darkness. And so light reveals and light warns. 
If you ever see a light go up on your dashboard in your vehicle, you better pay attention to it. Some of you are laughing because you didn't. Right? It warns. We are, should be warning people that there is a hell coming. We need to be warning people that without Jesus, there is no life. Don't sugarcoat it. That's not love. Well, you'll be okay. Are they a believer? Yeah, they, they believe in God. No, are they a believer? Does their life show it? You know, if you're a believer in Christ, you know if somebody else is a believer in Christ. Stop sugarcoating it. That's not love. True love warns. True love reveals. Because that's what light does. Amen? And listen, God has always wanted his people to be light. Paul quotes the Old Testament prophet Isaiah in the New Testament. He says, this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a what? A light for the Gentiles. Why? That you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. God wanted his Old Testament people to be a light to the rest of the nations. He wants us to be a light to all people everywhere. So everywhere we go in the world. You know where our light shines? In the world. If you shine your light only on Sundays when the, all the rest of the lights are together, there's not a lot of influence. But when you are the solitary light and you shine in darkness, there's great influence. You are the light of the world. Why? Because the world has no other light. The world doesn't have another light. It's either us or darkness. So Jesus gives us two pictures to remind us, describe this truth that we are kingdom influencers and then he tells us the goal of our influence is to actually help people change, be transformed, become salt and light as well, and glorify God in heaven. But he also gives two warnings. And these two warnings are not to the world. These two warnings are to the influencer. Are you an influencer? Are you part of the kingdom of God? Then these two warnings are for you. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but... If the salt loses its saltiness, its tastiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Just throw it out there. Maybe it'll help a little bit with the, the mud and, and the stuff out there, but that's all it's good for. It's lost its influence. In verse 16, in the same way, he says, you're, 14, you are the light of the world, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl that's stupid instead you put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven so jesus warns us about two things about salt and light he says listen i warn you don't lose your saltiness don't lose your tastiness. He says, if, you, if the salt loses its saltiness, what's it good for? And he says, if the light is hidden, what good is it? All you're doing is hiding it and there's still darkness. So he warns us as believers. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Be careful not to lose your flavor. You are the light of the world. Be careful not to dim your light. In other words, he says, make sure that you remain Tasty and bright. Turn to somebody and say, be tasty and bright. Be tasty, my friend. So how can you maintain your influence in the world around you? How do you stay salty? How do you not lose your taste? How do you, how do you not dim your light? Here's a way. Number one, don't let anything dilute your tastiness. This is not on the screen, but you might want to write this down. Don't let anything dilute your tastiness. Don't let anything stop you from being salty. Not in a good way. Okay? Here's the thing I want you to understand. Salt cannot stop being salt. So when God says, when Jesus said it loses his saltiness, the only way that it can lose its saltiness if it is if it's mixed or diluted by something else. If you get a handful of salt, it's super salty. If you put it in a glass and you begin to fill that water and you mix it with water, the more water you have, the less salty it is. You have diluted it by mixing it with something else. So here's the deal, guys. 
God is warning us, be careful with your life. Don't let any sin dilute it. Because the thing that will cause our saltiness to be lost the quickest is when we allow our lives to be diluted by the sin of this world, by the impurities of this world. There are believers that want to keep one foot in the world and the other one in the kingdom of God. And you know what they're doing? They are diluting their saltiness. And the more of the world is in our lives, the less salty we're going to be and the less influential we're going to be. In fact, Jesus said, if you lose your saltiness, you're useless for the kingdom of God. You have lost your ability to influence. We cannot fulfill our purpose on earth if we allow ourselves to be mixed with the stuff of this world. Listen, the Old Testament, the Old Testament followers of, of God, the people of God, they never stopped worshiping, worshiping Jehovah. They're like, oh, Jehovah's a true God. I worship him. But you know what they did? They mixed their worship of the one true God with the worship of the pagan gods of this world. And they diluted their faith and they lost all influence on the people around them. Don't lose your saltiness. Stay tasty, my friend. As light, don't allow anything to block the light. So again, remember this. We don't have light in ourselves. We are just the reflection of the light of Christ. So how do we dim ourselves? When we put anything that will block his light from flowing to us. When we stop looking at the face of Christ that is the glory of God that shines in us and through us. Now we have dimmed our light. So be careful not to let anything stop you in your walk with Jesus. Don't be afraid to shine your light. Here's another thing that stops us if we're, if we're fearful. Well, I know, you know, I don't want to tell people I'm a follower of Jesus. They can just see it with my life. No, you're just scared. Stop being afraid. God doesn't have secret agents or undercover agents for Jesus. No, we shine our light before people. And it dispels the darkness. So live your life so that it dispels the darkness around you. God doesn't want any undercover secret agent Christians. Look what he says again. Let your light shine. That means that there's, an, there's the ability of not letting it shine. He says, let it shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Ephesians 5 says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. And find out, do your best to find out what pleases the Lord. Now listen, and we don't have to work at what pleases us. That comes naturally. He says, find out what pleases the Lord and go after that. And he says, do everything without what? Come on, somebody. How many would just remember this and quote it to your child later on today in this whole week? Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you will be blameless and pure. So, so stop for a second. So you're at, job, at your job, and you're complaining the same way that everybody else in that workplace is complaining. You have lost your influence. You're no different from anybody else. Amen? It's like, man, I should have worn my steel-toed boots today. But it's true. He says, listen, if you stop complaining and stop arguing... You'll be blameless and pure. You'll be children of God without any fault. For you are living with evil people all around you who have lost, they have lost their sense of what is right. Among those people, among those people, shine like lights in a dark world as you offer them the message that gives light. It's not just how you live, it's what you say. It's what you share. Here's the deal, guys. We're like, when we get together, we're like the salt shaker. Salt that stays in a shaker doesn't do anybody any good. So think of this way. You come together, and then you learn God's word. You're strengthened. You're empowered. And then the salt shaker shakes you out there. And you go be the salt of the earth. Light doesn't illuminate where there's a bunch of other light. If you have a bunch of light and you put one more light, it's not going to make any difference. So this is the lighthouse. But go out there where there's darkness and make sure that you shine your light don't be afraid. Let God use you as his kingdom influencer. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are a change agent for Jesus. You are a difference maker. 
Don't let the devil tell you otherwise. You are God's kingdom influencer. Can you say it with me? I am God's kingdom influencer. Just make sure that you stay tasty and bright. Amen? Come on, stand with me. So here's the deal. We, we look to God's word and say amen to it with a desire that we, God would use that word to change us. And any time that I really listen to God's word, any time that I really have paid attention to God's word, he's always shown the light on something that's dark inside me. That's not like Jesus that needs to change. And the more that changes, the brighter the light of him shines to those around us. So will you bow your heads? We're going to take some inventory right now with the help of the Holy Spirit. And you've been listening to this and you've recognized, not in your own accord, you, Holy Spirit's help you realize that you haven't been living like salt and light. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus and you're like, you know what, I know Jesus and I gave my life to him and I really want to live for him. That desire that, to want to live for him is part of the evidence that you do belong to him. And you're like, ah, but I haven't been doing what I should be. And I, and I haven't been salt. I haven't been, I've been kind of living like the world. The world says it's okay for me to shack up with my, with my partner without being married. I, I, and that's what I've been doing. The world says it's okay for me to, to cuss and just like everybody else does. And it's, 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 that's what I've been doing. The world says it's okay. Man has needs. Women have needs. And so, I, you know, I... I've slept with people that, I, that I'm not married to, and the, but the world says it's okay. But that's not what we follow, friends. We don't follow the world. We ought to be different from the world. We walk in the ways of God. We do what pleases Him. We seek what pleases Him. And the more we are walking with Him, the greater the kingdom influence we have. Then the people around us will become, wanna, they'll want what we have. They'll become, they'll become thirsty for the things of God. They'll become thirsty for the God that has changed you and made you more like Jesus. If that's you right now. There's this wonderful gift that God's given us called repentance. He didn't give repentance to just un, unsaved and sinners. He gave repentance, the gift of repentance to the church. And repentance is very simple. We now understand because of God's word that the way we were thinking before about certain things was not right. So now I change my thinking about that thing and I change to, to think like God does about it. So what I thought was okay, I now know it's not. I turn from that and I turn to God. That's repentance. Asking God to forgive you for, for not knowing and, and maybe for knowing it and still doing it, whatever it may be. God offers forgiveness but he offers you the power to change as well. So right where you are, if that's you, you're a follower of Jesus and you recognize you haven't been living like salt and light, you haven't really been super influential to the people around you, school, work, family, you say, Lord, today I want to change. I realize it now, God. Forgive me for not letting my light shine. Forgive me for not being that, that salt that is so unique from those around me. So I give myself afresh to you and ask you to forgive me and give me the power to change, God. Make my light brighter for you. Make me tastier for you, God. Let my life cause people to want you. Maybe you're not a believer in Christ and you have never given your life to Christ. Well, that's the first step. You're not salt and light because you're not in Jesus. But it's easy to come to Christ. He doesn't reject you. He says, listen, Anyone who calls on me, I will accept. If you call on Christ and say, Lord, forgive me. God, I'm sorry. I know that I need you. I'm a sinner and I need you as my savior. From now on, I want you to be my king. I want to be one of your kingdom people. He knows your heart and he will move in and change you. And so right now, will you talk to God, all of you, just begin to talk to God regardless of what it was that he's shown you, whether you've never served him or maybe you have been, but you just need change in your life, just tell him, Lord, I need you. I need change. Father, I pray for these that are praying right now and talking to you, and, and I pray, God, that you would do something supernatural in them. God, I did my part. I just presented the truth. But it's you. You're the one that brings change. You're the power that changes us, God. 
And I know you did it in my life. You'll do it for others. We don't need reformation from the outside. We need a transformation from the inside. And so I, God, God, I pray that right now, as a result of their faith in you, believing in you, God, trusting in you, receiving what you have for them, I pray that lives will be transformed right now in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to pray specifically for you. And just so I know where you are, I want you to do something very simple, very simple. With every head bowed, no one looking around, just raise your hand real quick so I can know where you are and I can pray with you. Come on, raise it up. Yep, yep, over to my left, over to my right, over here in the back, the center, looking up in the balcony. Others that would say, me too, will you pray with me, Pastor? Yes, yes. So right where you are, Keep that hand lifted up to the Lord right now and just say, Jesus, here I am. Change me. Forgive me. Make me a new person. I receive you as my king, as my savior. From now on, I will seek to do what pleases you. God, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for raising from the dead. Thank you that one day you're coming back for me. I give my life afresh to you, King Jesus. In your name we pray it. Amen.